In the mid-90s, animation was changing, for better or for worse. With the success of Disney Pixar's Toy Story in 1995, computer-generated imagery was proving itself to be a real player within the realm of feature-length entertainment. For the first time, Pixar had defined what was possible, and for other animation studios, transitioning to a 3D format no longer felt like such a blind leap of faith. With that being said, Pixar would almost exclusively dominate the realm of animated films in the 90s, without any real competition until DreamWorks hit its stride with Shrek in 2001. Before that, it was Disney's impressive catalog of expertly animated feature films versus DreamWorks' ants. You gotta start somewhere. The fact of the matter was, bringing a fully animated 3D feature to the big screen was an expensive and risky undertaking. There were really only a handful of companies with the resources to even take the chance. This led many studios to set their sights on smaller budget projects more fit for television. While Pixar ruled the feature-length world with an iron fist, many smaller animation studios would take the plunge into developing fully 3D animated projects for TV. This would lead to a novel surge of 3D animated television shows in the mid-90s that, while visually impressive, left some of us thinking, just because we can, doesn't mean we should. <sighs> Just no pleasing some people. Regardless, the trend had swept throughout the entire entertainment industry, and would open more and more networks up to the idea of greenlighting their next big show as a CG product. As luck would have it, this particular climate would set the stage for writer-director John A. Davis to catch his first big break. And it all started from an idea Davis had in the early 80s. Around this time, a young Davis was toying with the idea of a live-action short film starring a boy genius named Jimmy Neutron. Just kidding, it was Johnny Quasar. We're not quite there yet. The character was a sort of alter ego for Davis, who was always fascinated by gadgets and science fiction as a boy, but never quite had the math skills or technical know-how to pursue it as a career. Regardless, Davis would live vicariously through his character, developing a short narrative around Quasar titled Runaway Rocket Boy. The original premise was scripted and storyboarded, telling the tale of a young boy who runs away from his parents in a rocket ship. Davis had built up big hopes for the project, picturing a film clad with special effects and outlandish gadgets, somewhat akin to the final product we would eventually get. But in the 1980s, things weren't so DIY. In order to get the ball rolling on the concept, Davis would need to pitch the show to production companies, and would even resort to applying for a government grant. Unfortunately, this would not pan out, and Davis was denied funding on the grounds that, although the idea revolved around a boy genius, the show wasn't all that educational or informative. Unless Davis was able to provide a scientific explanation for the shrink ray, or detailed insight on the dietary components of Purple Flurp, it looked like he'd be out of luck. The rejection would result in Runaway Rocket Boy getting shelved for quite a lengthy period of time. It was only much later in the mid-90s that Davis would rediscover the script while moving. Upon revisiting the story and its characters, Davis came to the realization that Runaway Rocket Boy would make a perfect fit for a CG animated show, something that Davis and his animation studio had been dabbling into at the time. A decade ago, this kind of approach wasn't really realistic, but now Pixar and many other studios had proven that 3D animated entertainment was a real possibility. This would motivate Davis to pursue the idea with his own studio, DNA Productions. You know the one. Hi, I'm Paul. In 1995, the studio would compile a 40-second visual demo starring the runaway Rocket Boy himself, alongside his new sidekick, Goddard. Bark, bark, bark. The demo was short but sweet, with Quasar flying into frame on a rocket, introducing himself, and then veering off into space to avoid an asteroid. Although brief, the animated demo did a perfect job of illustrating the potential of the character, with a charming and concise monologue that could flawlessly serve as the basis for an entire brainstorming session had it been given to writers. Not to mention, the animation was incredibly impressive. I'm a genius, but sometimes I'm too smart for my own good. Turns out DNA Productions was working with a 3D animation software called Lightwave. And this wasn't a big-budget Pixar program or an industry-standard set of tools. 
What DNA was able to accomplish with commercial software in 1995 was genuinely impressive, and it motivated the team to show off their work at the 1995 SIGGRAPH convention, which was hosted by an association with a special interest in computer graphics. There at the convention, Davis and his studio would submit the film into a contest exclusively for Lightwave projects. And to the company's surprise, Runaway Rocket Boy would steal the show, receiving two separate awards that night. One for Best Character Animation, and the other for Best in Show. The project was praised for its smooth animation and cartoonish character design, setting it apart from the majority of studios striving for a more photorealistic approach to their renders. These achievements would end up garnering the project a fair bit of buzz in the animation community. Shortly after, Hollywood actor-producer Steve Odekirk would stumble across some still images of Johnny Quasar in an animation magazine, instantly piquing his interest. Odekirk was quite the hotshot in the entertainment industry, known best for his collaborations with Jim Carrey on the Ace Ventura series, a character with a suspiciously familiar haircut. Turns out, Odekirk had taken a particular interest in the world of 3D animation, and was eager to get in touch with Davis and his team about the demo. Odekirk cold called Davis at his studio in Dallas, in the hopes that he could see the full video along with anything else the team had done with Quasar. After receiving the original demo and story bible, Odekirk was sold, proving eager to join forces with Davis's company to help pitch the idea to bigger networks. This would result in DNA Productions joining forces with O Entertainment, which was Odekirk's production company at the time. The partners would work to flesh out the idea into a marketable television show, reworking the name to The Adventures of Johnny Quasar, and tweaking aspects of the original character to appear more childlike. I mean, for God's sake, they gave the kid a receding hairline. Keith Alcorn, Davis's partner at DNA, would take on most of the character design, swapping out Johnny's lab coat for a regular t-shirt and changing his hair in favor of a more eccentric style. Only then would the producers deem the concept ready for a network tour. The first stop on the team's list was Nickelodeon, and to Davis's surprise, it would also be their last. Nickelodeon immediately fell in love with the concept. Johnny Quasar's super-powered mind and knack for adventure made him the perfect Nick kid, as observed by then-president of Nickelodeon, Albie Hecht, who famously dubbed Quasar as a mix between Bart Simpson and Albert Einstein. In reality, it's no wonder that Davis's pitch caught Nickelodeon's attention. Jimmy's 3D character design completely set him apart from many of Nick's current and future characters like SpongeBob, Arnold, Tommy, and Lil Bill. Actually, actually no, not Lil Bill. Let's, let's forget about Lil Bill. Naturally, a deal was struck, and Nickelodeon would commission a 13-minute pilot episode in the fall of 1995. From there, Johnny Quasar would fall headfirst into review purgatory, with over two lengthy years of pull this and add that to draw out the project's development. During that time, a newly animated demo would be produced, serving as a sort of updated take on the original 1995 demo of Johnny Quasar. Nickelodeon loved it, but toward the end of the reviewal process, Davis was forced to rework Johnny's name as it already shared similarities with two pre-existing cartoon characters, those being Johnny Quest and Captain Quasar. Oh, and he had 24 hours to do it, so the story goes. Davis would frantically brainstorm names with his wife that night, experimenting with a myriad of scientific terms like proton and electron before finally settling on Jimmy Neutron. And with that out of the way, the team could finally begin work on the pilot episode. Production would begin in late 1997, with the pilot fully completed sometime in 98. The first episode of Jimmy Neutron was cleverly titled Runaway Rocket Boy, as an homage to the project's roots, and featured all the characters and quirks that fans would soon come to know and love. You promised to help me with math class. Sure, I know. Okay, okay. I will. I will. It was early Jimmy, but Jimmy nonetheless, and Nickelodeon absolutely loved it. When Davis asked the company what the next move was for the show, Nickelodeon would spill the news that they had even bigger plans for the franchise. Not only did Nick want to produce a television show, they also wanted to release a feature-length film as well. Davis described this moment as jaw-dropping. 
At the time, Davis had been working up the courage just to propose a theatrical short to open up the next Rugrats movie, and never dreamed that Nick would want a feature-length film so early in the game. Yet at the same time, this also sparked an idea for Davis. Originally, Nickelodeon proposed to air the television show first, and follow up with the movie shortly after. But what if they did it in reverse? With 3D animation, everything that was produced became a reusable asset, and if the studio developed all these assets with a feature film budget, they could reuse the high-quality models once it was time to work on the show. Nickelodeon was hesitant at first. Attracting a movie audience for a character that lacked any pre-existing media would be a definite risk, and the TV show first approach seemed like a more surefire way to introduce Jimmy to the world. But Davis's reasoning made a lot of sense. Producing the movie first would allow for the team to develop a higher quality TV show, and possibly improve the longevity and success of the franchise. Every character, every scene, every bush, every gadget, it could all be recycled. And it didn't stop there. Assets could and would be reused for every promotion and print ad that Jimmy Neutron would do. With CG animation still in its early stages, this kind of forward-thinking approach was what allowed 3D animated shows to thrive. In the end, Nick decided that with the right amount of promotion, launching with the movie was a viable option. And in the fall of 1999, Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius would be greenlit for production. The movie was given a budget of 30 million, allowing Davis and his team to significantly increase the capacity of their offices. The company's staff burst from just 30 employees to 130, granting the studio the means to achieve their tightly set deadlines. This would also allow for more tweaking to be done to the show's characters, which would differ slightly from the original pilot episode. Jimmy's shirt would change, Sheen's ethnicity would switch from Japanese to Mexican, and Carl would be redrawn to look less like his dad. Steps were taken to forego the traditional rulebook of CG animation, with realistic lighting and character design thrown to the wayside in favor of more stylistic approaches. If a light or a shadow didn't look right in a certain shot, it would be taken out, regardless of whether or not it physically made sense to be there. Characters were given simplistic and cartoonish designs that were easier to animate, along with characteristics that influenced the structure of the world around them, like the cars modeled to fit their outrageously large heads. Additionally, their sculpted graphic look made the modeling process easier too, without needing to worry about realistic textures for cloth or hair. In a way, the movie's low budget pushed animators to get creative, and this ultimately contributed to its originality. And in the world of animation, standing out was everything. In 1999, you could practically count on one hand the number of 3D animated films that had been released on the big screen, and literally all of them had been produced by Disney or DreamWorks. When Nickelodeon threw their hat in the ring, it was open knowledge that they were going up against the big dogs. But at the same time, it never felt like the movie was trying to prove anything. Davis knew their budget was significantly lower than that of Toy Stories or A Bug's Life, but it didn't matter. The atmosphere and concepts behind the project were entirely unique, and that was part of its charm. The show's creators would even go as far as to take ideas from their own children, with Steve Odekirk's six-year-old daughter coining the idea for burp soda. A guaranteed one burp per sip. Zoe Odekirk would go on to be listed under the special thanks for the movie's end credits. Additionally, Nickelodeon's budget made for a simpler production process. While many other companies were using complex rendering programs and working with software engineers to produce state-of-the-art animation, Jimmy Neutron was built with simple, commercial software that was accessible to anyone. And while the team's tool set and workflow had somewhat increased in complexity, much of the process was still the same. This allowed the team to complete the entire film in just 24 months, roughly half the time it took the average CG film to be completed. To make things even more exciting, Jimmy Neutron was already an enormous hit with children, as Nickelodeon had been working hard to promote the character during the movie's production. Not only were there online comics and flash games, but there were also clever tie-in promotions with other Nickelodeon shows. These promotional gags would have Jimmy interrupt an episode of Spongebob or the Rugrats to make a little mischief with one of his gadgets before quickly disappearing off-screen. It was a somewhat heartwarming collaboration, 
as the shows that cooperated in the promotion would have to accomplish work on their end to stage the gag and help welcome Jimmy to the Nickelodeon family. There was also a series of interstitial shorts that would air between episodes of Nickelodeon shows, helping to familiarize audiences with the movie's characters prior to the release of the film. In many ways, kids felt like they already knew Jimmy Neutron well before the theatrical announcement, and that was kind of Nick's plan. Jimmy Neutron had placed within the top 25 favorite cartoon show characters on television, which was determined by a consumer familiarity survey that helped companies gauge the appeal of certain public brands. And this survey was conducted before any hard piece of media had even been published for the boy genius. From the looks of it, Nick's promotion was turning out to be everything they'd hoped for. It was 2001 at this point, and as production was wrapping up for the film, a release date was finally in sight. And with hype for the Jimmy Neutron franchise nearly reaching its pre-launch peak, Nick was finally ready to make their movie announcement at the 2001 Kids' Choice Awards. Jimmy would even appear on screen to announce some of the night's winners before being promptly brushed to the side by Rosie O'Donnell, who would go on to raise a very pressing question to the audience. Anybody here want a slime in sync? What can you do? It was 2001. But now, with a release date set for late December of that year, the real hype train could begin. Nick would team up with several companies to promote the upcoming movie, including some pretty clever partnerships like the Trident Gum promotion that paired perfectly with Jimmy's iconic bubblegum scene. Bubble travel is the way of the future! Nick would also work with Radio Shack to produce the Ultra Orb, an RC car that closely resembled Sheen's spaceship from the film. And of course, who could forget the mediocre video game? In the early 2000s, it was practically a prerequisite. The month before the film's release, the Jimmy Neutron game would launch for all platforms, which would follow the same story as the movie, but just a whole lot less fun and a whole lot more creepy. Read my lips, N O. No. Although this wouldn't stop Nickelodeon from releasing a brand new Jimmy Neutron game for four consecutive years in a row. I feel kind of funny, Jim. Regardless, Nickelodeon's promotion paid off because Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius was a hit with children upon its release. Yes, the movie may have only garnered slightly above average reviews by critics, but who cares? Those were boring adults, and this one was for the kids. Jimmy Neutron would even go on to be nominated for the Oscar's first ever award for Best Animated Feature, respectfully losing to DreamWorks' smash hit Shrek. But weep not, my friends. For the real winners are those who now carry the knowledge that Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius is technically an Oscar-nominated film. On top of that, the movie would gross over $102 million worldwide throughout its theatrical run, giving Nickelodeon more than enough reason to follow up with the TV show. The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron would first air in July of 2002, a little over six months after the release of the film. Davis's plan had worked perfectly, and the team's strategy to reuse the majority of the assets from the movie resulted in one of the most visually impressive 3D animated shows to ever air at the time. The TV show would go on to make a respectable three-season run that aired from 2002 to 2006, and would be accompanied by a myriad of video game, book, and merchandising tie-ins that made Jimmy Neutron a Nickelodeon household name. With all this success, you'd assume Nickelodeon would have greenlit a second film shortly after. And you'd be right. The network would in fact move forward with plans to develop a sequel to the original movie, but the project would be subsequently cancelled due to internal disagreements in the writer's room. Turns out, the team in charge of Jimmy's sequel just couldn't agree on an angle for the film, and the indecision would last long enough for Nickelodeon to just scrap the project altogether. In its place, a television spin-off would premiere in 2010, starring Sheen, Jimmy's best friend, which interestingly enough, originated as a rejected television pitch for a show called Red Acres. Eventually, the concept would be reworked as a Jimmy Neutron spin-off to catch Nick's attention. But alas, Planet Sheen would come to an end in 2013, marking the end of the Jimmy Neutron franchise as we know it today. As a matter of fact, it's really still quite a mystery as to why Nickelodeon decided to pull the plug on the original show in the first place. Some blame DNA Productions' involvement with The Ant Bully, a film that was speculated to be responsible for the company's eventual bankruptcy in 2006. 
Keith Alcorn, co-creator of Jimmy Neutron, has gone on to say that Nickelodeon simply opted not to renew the show for more seasons on the basis that they already had enough material for syndication, a process that involved the leasing of a television show to other networks. Regardless of the reason, Jimmy Neutron is still fondly remembered by fans to this day, and the show's technical achievements helped pave the way for the dozens of 3D animated cartoons that would follow for years to come. As of today, the franchise's fate is caught in a swirl of reboot rumors, false speculation, and fan art so convincing it almost made you think there was a 2023 reboot coming to Paramount+. Plus. There's not, sorry. But the love for the show is still there, and maybe, with enough time, Nick will take notice and everyone's favorite boy genius will blast off again. And if not, hey, at least we still got this. Are you going to finish that croissant? Knock yourself out.